New York. This is Joshua Walker at Japan Society. Konbanwa to all of you joining us from Japan and wherever you're coming from. Uh, we're particularly excited today for the conversation that we're about to have uh, with Professor Jerry Curtis uh, and Professor Hazo Takanaka. Before that, my job is to simply welcome you and to thank our global sponsors, City and Deloitte, along with our corporate sponsors, Mizuho Financial Group and Toyota Motors of North America that make our work here at Japan Society possible. I also wanna thank our co-organizers, co the Center on Japanese Economy and Business at the Columbia Business School, Apex Study Center at Columbia University, and the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. And we're particularly excited to have our board member and also the Dean of SIPA, as we all love to call uh, Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, Merit Janau. Merit, let me turn it over to you. You're the Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs, the Professor of prof Professional Practice in International Economics, and also a longtime board member of Japan Society. Let me turn it over to you to offer a few uh, remarks about today's discussion. Well, thank you very much, Joshua, and good morning and good evening. It's fantastic uh, to join all of you, you know, as a longtime director of the society and affiliated with all of the units that are co-sponsoring today. It's an enormous pleasure uh, for me to welcome all of you. Professor Jerry Curtis is our greatly revered expert uh, at Columbia on Japanese politics and policy. He's been a student of Japanese politics and a friend to Japanese policymakers. For 50 years, he's written seminal books in Japanese and in English. I think no non-Japanese knows Japan and Japanese politics and foreign policy better. I think of him as going from the you know, precinct to the Conte uh, in, 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 in his life, uh, and, it, and he's just remarkable. Professor Heizo Takenaka is a truly remarkable individual, scholar, politician, economist, thinker, and for us at Columbia University, former visiting fellow at the Center on Japanese Economy, frequent lecturer and very good friend. So on behalf of Columbia and dare I say Japan society, I'm really thrilled to welcome you. Today's discussion could not be more timely, of course, given the recent appointment of Prime Minister Suga. And of course, uh, 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 Professor Takenaka knows him so well, Jerry Curtis as well. He's been a key figure in the uh, years of the uh, Abe cabinet. It's a very difficult time for the world, for Japan, for the United States, and the U.S.-Japan relationship is a crucial and close relationship. What policies is the prime minister going to pursue in the months ahead, and what are Japanese people seeking by way of continuity uh, and change? What are his personal priorities? I'm really interested in, in hearing how Japan is going to pursue recovery. There's talk about a new digital ministry. What's that? Sounds fascinating. What are his foreign policy objectives? So I know with Jerry and Hazo, uh, we will have really unique insights. Thank you so much for making time for us. Joshua Walker, over to you. Thank you, Dean. Uh, it's so great uh, to have, uh, as she said, all this group together. She just basically did my job and introduced uh, Professor Jerry Curtis and Heizo Takanaka. So let me just start right there, uh, Jerry Sensei. Um, the next year for Suga, when you read the American press, there's this kind of uh, moniker that people have put there as caretaker prime minister. Um, do you agree with that? Or what do you think the next year looks like? And what does Suga have to do uh, to make sure that moniker is not his for the future? Uh, thank you, Joshua, and uh, good morning, everyone. Good evening, uh, wherever you, you are. I'm, I'm really delighted to, that we're able to do this, and I'm especially grateful to my friend, Heizo Takenaka, for, for joining us uh, this evening. What we're going to do is have a conversation about uh, this, new, this new government, this new prime minister, what we expect, what the hopes are, and so forth and, and so on. So, so just in, in to, to sort of lay the the, the scene here um, and to respond to Joshua's uh, uh, question, Mr. Suga has just it was two days ago elected as president of the LDP for one year. That is to serve out the remainder of the term that Mr. Abe, Prime Minister Abe, had until next September. A few hours ago, he became prime minister. Uh, today in, 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 in Japan. So, uh, I've, I, so Prime Minister Suga has no intention of being a caretaker if he can avoid it. He wants to 
be re-elected as party president next September for a normal regular three-year term and continue as prime minister. So he has 12 months uh, to convince the public, convince his party that he's the person who should continue in that office. And I think he has to do two things between now and then. One, he has to call an election, win the election. And the question, well, he, you know, the LDP will win because the opposition party is a disaster, but in the disaster situation, when is he gonna call an election and what are the implications? Uh, he's being very cagey about it at the moment, but I think, you know, he can, I think the longer he waits to call an election, the more dangerous it is, it is for him. Um, the elder people win a majority, that's not an issue, but they can lose quite a number, few, a number of seats in the, next, in the next election. They have a very big majority now. If he waits until next summer to call an election and loses some seats, it will be seen as kind of a referendum, a negative referendum on Suga. I think the chances are very good that he will in the end call an election before the end of this calendar year, probably in November or December, get it over with, end the speculation about when he's gonna have an election and also probably reshuffle his cabinet. The cabinet he formed today is a, is a carry on, carryover from the Abe cabinet. 15 of the 20 people in it were in the, were in the, in the previous cabinet. I think we'll see an election. We'll see him win. It'll be fairly soon. There'll be some important changes uh, in the cabinet and he will get on with the second thing he has to do to get reelected as president and continue as prime minister. And that is actually bring about meaningful reform. I think, and I'll ask um, uh, Professor Takanaka to comment on this in a, in, a couple, in a few minutes, but I think that Mr. Suga is in some ways, even though he's gonna continue Abenomics, continue Abe's policy in, in, to, 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 to a degree, he's a very different personality. You know, Prime Minister Abe, his passion was constitutional revision and making Japan a big player on the world, on the international stage. I think Mr. Suga is quite different. Mr. Suga is very much focused, just to finish that point. And so Abenomics for Mr. Abe was the means to accomplish this bigger end, the political goals that, that Mr. Abe had in mind about Japan being a major world player and having and revising the constitution, especially Article 9. Mr. Suga is very much focused on uh, economic reform. He was the, the internal affairs minister under Prime Minister Koizumi, first as vice minister on, with, when, when Takenaka-san was the, was the minister, and then as minister while uh, you know, Mr. Takenaka was in charge of, of economic policy. Uh, I think in many ways, he, his approach is much more that of Mr. Koizumi and Mr. Takenaka in terms of economic, economic policy. He is going to have to do things, show the public that he knows what needs to be done to recover the economy, to grow, to get COVID problem under control, um, uh, and that he actually is capable of getting, uh, that he gets things done. So we've already heard He's just become prime minister today, but we know he's going to create a digital technology agency. He wants to have reforms that will remove obstacles to greater digitalization of the Japanese economy, more online medical consultation, more online uh, uh, classes. Um, uh, he's talked a lot about wanting to reorganize, restructure uh, small and medium sized enterprises to become have better labor productivity, more competitive, more international. He's talking about the problem of overbanking in local banks. Uh, he's a big proponent of bureaucratic reform, ending the so-called stovepipe system where each ministry does its own thing with little with, with poor coordination among them. Uh, uh, and strengthen the power of the prime minister over the bureaucracy. This gets criticized by some people in Japan, but it's what democracy is about, that the people who get elected by the public are the ones who make the decision and bureaucrats job is to advise them well and then carry out the decisions that are made. So 
I think it would be, you know, since he was chief cabinet secretary for so long, the entire time Abe has been prime minister, people, a lot of people think of him as an operator, um, a coordinator for somebody else's policies and underestimate, possibly underestimate how much Suga is his own man in terms of thinking about economic reform and 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 social and social social reforms, so uh, I think there is um, uh, the possibility that he'll be very dynamic. He doesn't have much time, you know. If he doesn't do things in the next twelve months, he is history, and Japan will be back to revolving door prime ministers. So he's under a time pressure. Uh, he will have to produce some results, and he's a very tough decisive, um, focused individual. My impressions from my, my interactions with him, he's a very good listener. He has a broad network of people that advise him. Um, uh, he listens hard, he makes up his mind and he gets things done. That's my take. So there's reasons to be hopeful that he will be a dynamic leader. He's, his middle name is not charisma. He's not. He's not charismatic, but he knows how to get things done. And the public, if the public appreciates that, I think we may see Mr. Suga go on for a considerable amount of time as Prime Minister of Japan. But having late said that, I do want to ask um, uh, uh, Mr. Takanaka what you, how you see the the this situation, where you disagree, or if you disagree with things I'm saying, or what you want to emphasize, what you would emphasize, and. Uh, get you into the conversation here. So welcome, uh, Hezo, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Curtis. <laughs> and also, I'd like to say thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Walker and Professor Jano. I also, I'd like to say thank you very much uh, to all the people whose effort made this opportunity possible. It's my great pleasure and great honor joining this session. Well, <clears throat> honestly speaking, Professor Curtis, I spoke everything about what I know. Uh, yes, I, I basically completely agree with your uh, views on the uh, Suga cabinet. Uh, in my capacity, I'd like to speak three things. One is uh, Mr. Suga's background, uh, his characteristics. Uh, number two is uh, his policy, especially economic policy. And number three is an uh, important political decision, election, election timing. Uh, let me start with uh, his characteristics. Um, maybe you know that uh, former Prime Minister Abe established the longest lasting cabinet in the history of Japan politics. And his uh, cabinet continued seven years and eight months. Uh, this is the longest uh, history, in, especially including his first cabinet uh, about 10 years ago. And, <clears throat> and his father, former Prime Minister Abe's father was the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Minister of Trade. And his grandfather was a prime minister. And the also grand uncle was also prime minister. However, in the case of Mr. Suga, he was born and grown up in the rural area. And graduating from high school, he came to Tokyo. And he worked for uh, at first in the factory. Then he joined the night school of Hosei University. And at the age of 38 or 39, uh, he became the city council member of Yokohama. And at the age of 47, maybe he became the, uh, the diet man, a member of the uh, lower house. In that sense, he's a really the man of Japanese dream. You have American dream, uh, but uh, he realized the Japanese dream. In that sense, many people, many uh, public uh, people, uh, uh, audience are, uh, you know, uh, expecting a lot on him. Uh, in that sense, I'm so also, I was also born in the rural area and came to, came to Tokyo. Uh, in that sense, I also expect on him. Uh, well, when I was a minister for internal affairs and communication, uh, he worked together with me. And at that time, I, if I had to focus the uh, privatization of Japan Post and the new vision for the communication, the television and the broadcast, imagine uh, uh, effect of the internet, et cetera, et cetera. So all other important jobs of the ministry were was taken by uh, Mr. Suga. He was a really, in a sense, a substantial minister of internal affairs and communication. He did an excellent job. 
he had a very strong political muscle, political muscle. He's very decisive and he had a very strong power to realize uh, the, what, uh, the necessary policies. And uh, so in that sense also, uh, many people are now at this moment expecting on his uh, political muscle. Regarding the policy, economic policy, he explicitly uh, stated that he will succeed. The framework of uh, economic policy by former Prime Minister Abe, Abenomics. Abenomics had three components, three allows, we say, but this is a very reasonable one. The first uh, to have a, a very drastic, uh, drastic monetary expansion to conquer deflation. The second one is to take the flexible fiscal policy uh, to have a very economic, uh, to, to appropriate macroeconomic management. And third policy is the so-called growth strategy to enhance the potential growth rate of Japan. Uh, in this respect, of course, the structural reform is needed. And Mr. Suga is very ready to strengthen the third allow, the structural reform and the growth policy. And so I am expecting a lot on his uh, uh, political uh, and the policy management on this uh, issue. Well, <clears throat> especially in this uh, regard, he declared to establish a new agency, the Agency of Digitalization of Digital Affairs. Of course, at this moment, we are suffering from a COVID-19 uh, pandemic and economic crisis. In that respect, a remote education, remote uh, medical service, and the homework, uh, et cetera, it's, uh, uh, homeworking is needed. In that process, of course, digitalization is unavoidable. But still, he has more, more uh, strong, more, 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 what to say, ambition in this digital agency. Well, uh, he really wants to break or destroy the vertically divided ministry system. This was also mentioned by Professor Cardis. He loved the following uh, episode. Last year, we had a very serious flood uh, crisis, flood crisis. At that time, uh, dam, dam water discharge, discharging dam water was, became a very important uh, task for the government. However, at that time, uh, even Mr. Suga, he was the chief cabinet secretary, found for the first time, there are three types of dam in this country. One is controlled by the Ministry of Land, Ministry of Transportation, the one uh, controlled by Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, another one controlled by Agricultural Minister, Ministry. So there was no exchange of information with data. There is a tip that the symbol of the vertically divided ministry system. But in order to break down, break that, we need digitalization. Ministry of Finance should be digitalized. Ministry of Transportation should be digitalized. Ministry of Agriculture should be digitalized. So this digitalization will bring about the cross-functional, cross-functional effect. So this is the real purpose of his uh, uh, establishing this digital agency. So considering that, anyway, all things, I really expect that he will pursue the strengthen the growth policy, uh, breaking or the destroying the bureaucrat oriented system. Well, as for the foreign policy, maybe this will be discussed later, uh, but I do not say mu uh, much about that. He does not have an experience of foreign minister. He does not have an experience of trade negotiator. However, he already have a strong human network among world political leaders. In that sense also, I believe he will make a very uh, he will do it safely. And finally, election. This is politically the most important one, as was mentioned by Professor Curtis. Well, there are some criticism on a new government, new Suga government, because he was uh, mostly elected by the diet man and the party members voting this time of the LDP was skipped, uh, was not held this time. So some people will say that he, he is not abode by the general public. This is one criticism. Another one is, well, this is a very provisional government, or interim government, a provisional government. His term is very short. And sooner or later, another uh, prime minister, new prime minister will merge. 
And also at this moment, supporting ratio is high, but gradually this supporting ratio will decline. To avoid these three criticisms, very easy and reasonable solution is to dissolve the diet and have general election right now. The sooner the better. This is the solution. However, in my understanding, he will not have this kind of attitude. This is the sugar style. He really want to focus the anti-pandemic policy and economic policy. Uh, however, of course, uh, at latest, by next summer, next autumn, he will have to have uh, the election. So in that sense, uh, as was mentioned by Jerry, uh, toward the end of this year, year or at the beginning of next year, well, general election will be held. This is one possibility. But another possibility, second possibility is uh, he will focus uh, uh, the economic policy for a year or so, and the next year, next, uh, assuming Olympic Paralympic game will be held in next summer, but beyond that, election will be held. Well, of course, at this moment, just as was mentioned by Jerry, he will have some risk. The gradually, the supporting ratio will decline. Uh, this is a, a general trend of the uh, uh, public opinion. Uh, so in that sense, very finally, I would like to expect that he will show some early small success, early small success in his policy management. If so, uh, even if election time is delayed, he would have another chance to, to continue his, uh, his governance. Well, I, I really appreciate your comments and the questions, uh, uh, Merit and uh, Jerry. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for, for responding in that way. Um, Jerry, I don't see Jerry since I think he might have uh, lost his connection. He is in a rural part of Massachusetts and had warned us in advance. Uh, so Professor Curtis, if I don't see you uh, on the screen, I'm actually going to turn. Thankfully, uh, we, we have two people that can uh, speak to this. Uh, let me turn to you, uh, Dean Jano. Um, you know, uh, putting you on the spot here a little bit, uh, because Jerry uh, Sensei was going to focus specifically on kind of Suga and what that means. But I want to ask you more a broader question about foreign policy. I think Takenaka Sensei raised this, you know, Japan over the last seven years, uh, or eight years because of stability uh, that the Abe administration led, most people know Abe personally, whether it's the number of times he's interacted with President Putin of Russia, President Trump and Obama of the United States, Angela Merkel of Germany. There's something about the personal connection between the prime minister of Japan. And when it comes to foreign policy, given that Suga is a very well-known character inside Japan, but not necessarily outside, as Takenaka-san and Professor Curtis laid out, uh, he's more of a man of the people in Japan He's not a, a kind of a blue blood from uh, a family of a foreign minister or others. What do you think the implications are for the U.S.-Japan relationship, particularly literally 15, 50 days before a U.S. presidential election and Japan's role more broadly that Abe has really elevated? What, what do you kind of think as you think about this transition? Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I think that, um, you know, the U.S.-Japan relationship is very close. Uh, and uh, I'm not worried at all uh, about the U.S.-Japan relationship with, uh, uh, with Mr. Uh, Suga uh, as prime minister. I think for any new uh, leader, uh, it's difficult in this COVID era, obviously, to develop new personal ties. But I think he, uh, ha I would expect uh, that by virtue of the post that he has had and, and the, the, the responsibilities, um, and visibility and really close relationship with Prime Minister Abe, I would expect he's already had quite a lot of exposure to uh, senior leaders uh, around the world. When it comes to the US-Japan relationship, you know, in this period, you know, frankly, we're so inward looking right now, I don't think it's a moment when we are going to um, uh, be designing new initiatives. There's plenty of opportunity for um, interaction. So um, I'm, I'm not concerned about it. I think once um, uh, time passes and he's able to establish relationships in the world, I'm expecting also a lot from him in terms of his uh, ability to engage uh, globally. Um, but I think there we have uh, the true expert, Jerry Curtis back with us, uh, well, if, uh, if I, he can I, and yeah. hear us. Yeah, I can. So unbelievable, but the, uh, I got, 
all the light, all the electric, the electric power just went completely dead here at my at my house. So no internet on the computer and so on. But anyway, I'm on the phone, and I was able to connect. Um, so I'm back. Although I'm <laughs> unfortunately I missed some of what um, uh, Hazel uh, said er, said earlier. Um, on, but on farm policy. Uh, you know, I think on the on the domestic side, Mr. Suga has some very clear ideas about things he wants to do that are actually different um, than uh, than Mr. Abe. Or, or put it another way, he will do things that Mr. Abe talked about in terms of third arrow structural reform, but Suga will actually get them get them done. On foreign policy, <clears throat> the the Abe strategy strengthened the alliance with the United States. Increase Japan's defensive, defense, national defense capabilities. Um, promote a free trading system. Emphasize a free and open Indo-Pacific. These basic policies, this basic stance, will be continued by Mr. Suga. I don't see him um, uh, in any way doing, wanting to do anything different. And you know, he hasn't had much foreign policy experience, but. But he's been at the center of all the decisions uh, that the Abe administration has made about major issues. Um, and uh, so he, he knows a lot about foreign policy. Unfortunately, you know, because of COVID, he can't travel. He can't meet face to face with foreign leaders. Um, and we don't know when that will happen. But, but uh, I expect, uh, as I said earlier, uh, continuity in foreign policy he will emphasize his domestic reform, reform, reform agenda, and I expect that, that that he will rely heavily on Prime Minister Abe for advice about foreign affairs, and possibly for him for that is for prime for former Prime Minister Abe uh, to be an emissary dealing with foreign leaders uh, uh, and at least um, uh, uh, sort of helping Su Suga develop relationships with them. So, so I think I see you know, stability and continuity in foreign affairs, because it all depends on what events, events happen. And one thing about foreign policy, that foreign affairs that I would mention, I think you know, one of the big problems Japan has it's, is, is, is the awful deterioration of relations with South Korea. I think if um, South Korean president were to take advantage of the opportunity of this change in government to signal his interest, South Korea's interest in sort of pressing the reset button on Japan-South Korean relations, that they would get a very positive response uh, from Prime Minister Suga. But I'm not optimistic that that uh, South Korea, you know, that uh, um, that that the South Koreans will do will do what's necessary to make that happen. But so on the foreign policy side, I don't see much change. And on the, you know, in terms of the election, yeah, it could be as late as next summer. But I think, as I said before, um, sometime late, late this year, this calendar year, um, get the election over and move on with uh, concentrating on the reform agenda, uh, just along the lines that uh, Mr. Takenaka suggested. And uh, particularly, they're sort of trying to move the economy from being an analog to a digital-based economy. This is a big issue that every, we all face, but I think he's very serious about uh, digitalization, and uh, that can be the generator of growth in many different in many ways. So I'm back. Thank you. It's great. It's great to have you back. And the good news, <laughs> uh, Jerry Sensei, is that basically you and Takenaka Sensei agree on the the scope. The only difference that I'm hearing uh, is that Takenaka Sensei said that uh, the Suga style is to be a lot more cautious and to not have an election early. So there's that. Uh, Takenaka Sensei, let me uh, kind of have you respond, not necessarily just to the foreign policy piece that uh, you know Merit Sensei and Jerry Sensei laid out of continuity on foreign policy, but really economics is going to be the big driver of what. Japan's able to do. You also referenced uh, the Olympics, and there's a lot of uncertainty, and there's a lot of public polling that shows that there might be some Olympic fatigue, but yet we see that people seem determined to go ahead. This was going to be Prime Minister Abe's real legacy, literally coming out in Super Mario in Brazil to win the Tokyo Olympics. How does Suga inherit that? How does he manage that in his term so that it's a net positive and it doesn't end up hurting him in an unprecedented global pandemic like COVID-19? How does the economics work? Uh, work, given that's your area of expertise? 
Well, thank you very much again for this opportunity. Well, uh, let me talk a little bit about foreign policy, international uh, diplomacy. Well, as I mentioned, uh, well, he, uh, Mr. Suga does not have an experience on foreign minister. Uh, he does not have any uh, experience of the trade negotiator. However, uh, he acted as a controlling tower of all kinds of policies, uh, including foreign policy as a chief cabinet secretary, secretary for seven years. And uh, for example, when former, former Prime Minister Abe had a uh, telephone meeting, phone, uh, telephone conference with uh, President Trump, uh, he was also, all, uh, Mr. Suga was always sitting next to Prime Minister Abe and he would understand the content of the meeting. And also he, Mr. Suga very ex explicitly stated, he will succeed the basic idea of, for, for, for example, free and open Indo-Pacific cooperation. And also uh, he will play a very important role to, uh, to, uh, to preserve the uh, liberal world order where Japan had been developing based upon the, the free uh, world, world order, liberal world order, like free trade and uh, multilateralism and the globalism and so on. And the United States was the rule maker, but United, United States is uh, uh, changing, but Japan will play a very important role as a not rule maker, but rule shaper, rule shaper. That's basic style of Mr. Suga. So I, I completely agree with uh, uh, Professor Jane and Professor Curtis. So uh, this, uh, this foreign policy style will not change. Now the economy. Well, in the second quarter of this year, the growth rate of, of GDP was minus 28%, minus 28%. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the American growth rate was minus 32%, 33%. So anyway, it was very serious, seriously uh, damaged. Uh, however, Mr. Suga uh, uh, placed the very importance of the, uh, of the, well, combining the effort, the stop pandemic, and also the effort to stimulate the economy. He is very much interested in, the, in uh, these uh, for two policies simultaneously. And uh, he, he well understands that the importance of the uh, economic recovery. For example, now, now regarding pandemic, well, the total death ratio, death ratio to the total national population in Japan is quite low compared with the United States and European countries. The US ratio is about 40 times, 40 times of that of Japan. Italian uh, death rate is about 100 times of that of Japan. In that sense, of course, we have to be very cautious about this pandemic, but death ratio is low. The total number of deaths is uh, uh, 1,200 uh, 1200 or something like that. However, right after the birth of the bubble economy uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the, uh, the number of suicide, number of suicide exceeded 10,000 a year, 10,000 a year. That's an amazing number. So this is indicating how important to to recover the economy is to stop the number of stop or decrease of the number of deaths. So Mr. Suga well understand that. So well, I think uh, Mr. Suga uh, will uh, uh, place the great importance on the economic recovery policy, and also well, uh, uh, Mr. For that purpose, Mr. Nishimura, Minister Nishimura, is in charge of. Uh, anti-pandemic policy and also economic uh, policy. Mr. Nishimura is in charge of these policies. He remained in the cabinet. Uh, even the, uh, so considering uh, these factors, I think uh, Mr. Suga uh, will pay very special attention to both the anti-pandemic policy and economic policy and will realize the good result. I hope that. Thank you. Uh, Jerry, let me come back to you. We have a lot of questions coming in about the, the the factional politics of Japanese politics and the fact that Suga himself is not part of a faction. People have asked questions about what his cabinet represents, if it's more continuity, as you said, uh, as being Abe's cabinet and having to win his own uh, election mandate to have his own cabinet. Um, what does this mean for the future of factions in Japan? And also, what does the cabinet that we're currently looking at uh, mean? Um, I, there are two specific 
specific questions somebody wanted to know about Nikai's role as kind of a kingmaker, and then Todd Okono, who a lot of uh, expectation has been placed on given his fluency in English and his success as foreign minister, as defense minister. Um, just asking the broader question about factional politics and how that plays into the broader political landscape, given that all politics is local. Well, you know, of course, LDP has factions. Um, they always had, but have had them, but uh, factions are not what they once were. You know, in the old days when I was was young and following Japanese politics, faction bosses were themselves the candidates for prime minister. They they held, the, the factions were very cohesive. They were held together by the faction boss having lots of money to hand out to faction members who in return gave them loyalty. That's not the system now. They're groups of people uh, in the LDP that joined together to try to to, to, to leverage their, their ability to, to, to gain important posts and so on. Uh, but the faction system is not what it once was. And that's reflected in the fact that Mr. Suga, who is not in any faction, is prime, is, is prime minister. Um, it's not a weakness. His, his not being in a faction is not a weakness. It's actually a strength. It enables him, uh, he can get the support of, of everyone uh, and he can, if he has to, he can play one off against the, against the other. I don't really make that much of the faction system as as being um, important in the way that it, that it was it was in the past. The problem for Mr. Suga, or the issue for Mr. Suga, is not the factional balance of power in the LDP. The issue for Mr. Suga is can he do enough in a year? Can he do enough in the way of reform? in the way of showing the public that he knows what needs to be done to grow the economy, to spread prosperity across Japanese society, and that he can get it done and shows that he can get it done. If he does that, then he will go on as prime minister for, you know, for a regular three-year term as LDP, as LDP president. So if he's overly cautious, he's not gonna get very much done in 12 months. And if he doesn't get it done, he's gonna be, he's gonna be history. Uh, and then you'll see uh, new names uh, of people who will be competing for his success uh, to succeed him uh, come in, in next September's LDP election. And that includes people like uh, Kono Taro, uh, Mr. Kishida, the former foreign minister who, who ran this time and, you know, came in a very distant, uh, distant second. Uh, uh, Noda Seiko, uh, a woman uh, who is now the, the vice uh, the, the number two to Mr. Nikai is secretary, is deputy secretary general in, in the LDP. Um, Inada Tomomi, another woman who 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 was a former defense minister. There are a number of people. Mr. Motegi, the foreign minister. There are a number of names. Nishimura, that uh, uh, um, uh, Tanaka just just mentioned, uh, economic uh, uh, policy uh, minister. So, but I do think that. Yes, you know, Suka has to be careful, has to be cautious to an extent, but he has to move fast. And, you know, as, as Hazel knows better than anybody, one of the strengths of Prime Minister Koizumi was that Prime Minister Koizumi's attitude was, if the party doesn't like what I, what I want to do, they can always replace me. But as long as I'm here, I'm going to do what I think is necessary. And that was, you know, the fact that he was prepared to quit or prepared to, to leave was a great source of strength. So I'm hopeful that and hoping that Mr. Suga takes a similar attitude. I have 12 months to prove to the public that I can move this country forward and deal with these very critical issues. If he waits too long, he, then, then uh, it, it'll be, he'll, he'll, he, won't, he won't last. But I do think there's a very tough, decisive, resolute, uh, determined and ambitious politician. Um, and we should not underestimate the possibility that he will do some very serious, important things in the next, in the coming months. He doesn't have any time to, to waste. Great, thank you. Uh, Takenaka sensei, I'd love to hear your take on this, but also we're getting specific questions about uh, what you think Suga's agenda in terms of priorities will be. And uh, I think uh, Jerry sensei already mentioned the idea, uh, and I think Merritt as well uh, mentioned the idea of the digital agency. You talked about not being the, uh, the, the, the rule maker, but the rule shaper. What areas is that focused on? Is that in the digital space? Is it about these regional economic banks? You know, what is, what, what can we expect from Suga in terms of, you know, 
showing the progress that Jerry Sensei laid out that he needs to show to the Japanese public so that he can, he can win that term and become uh, his own kind of administration moving forward. So you're asking about what do you think is, is the most important uh, uh, well, strategic agenda, strategic agenda for Mr. Suga. This will be and should be decided by Mr. Suga himself. Well, uh, former Prime Minister Koizumi had very good at finding this kind of strategic agenda. But I, I, I expect, well, it's I, my, I guess, I think. Well, for example, as a minister for as a communication, Mr. Suga has been insisting the importance of reducing the cost of communication, a mobile phone cost. And he, this kind of idea is uh, uh, highly appreciated by the general public uh, because this communication cost now accounts for around 5% of the total expenditure of the household. So he will put some importance on this kind of effect. This, this, could, become, this could become the case of early small success. And another one is, uh, for example, digitalization or well, digital agency, where well, first of all, this digital agency should be established. But in that process, well, we now have a so-called my, my, my number card. This is the personal identification system, digital man in a medical manner, personal ID, I, uh, identification system. This was employed in the Abe government cabinet. However, there are a lot of restrictions. So, well, this is, my, car, my number card is not very popular. If we can change the system and this my number card could be used, for example, as a, the insurance card, as a driver's license, et cetera, et cetera, this will provide a very good impression on the general public. Well, I expect these two areas. Of course, as you mentioned, regional bank system is very important. And also uh, we should invite uh, some uh, financier from Hong Kong to Tokyo and Osaka, uh, establishing uh, the international uh, financial center, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But these are also done sh should be and will be done simultaneously. However, in my impression, the first priority will be, for example, uh, to introducing the, some competition po competition policy to the mobile phone market and reducing the cost of mobile phone. This could be very symbolic policy uh, for Mr. Suga because he loved competition. Uh, he came to uh, Tokyo and uh, he hates uh, people with vested inter interest, just like me. Thank you so much. Uh, Jerry Sensei, I'm getting a lot of I'm getting a lot of questions about specific foreign policy areas. I guess the, the broad one I want to simply ask is not specifically on Korea that you talked about or even Russia that people have asked about. The big one everyone's talking about is China. Do you think that there's a an opportunity or having a stylistic change, given that Suga is kind of an unknown uh, foreign policy or kind of a, a person out there. And given that COVID makes it difficult for there to be uh, human to human, leader to leader, uh, you know, contacts, whether it's the G7 that's been postponed uh, or whether it's the Olympics that Japan was supposed to host all these leaders, how does diplomacy get done in an environment like this? And then how does Suga use it as a strategic uh, uh, opportunity in the same way that Takenaka-san talked about uh, his can-do attitude in terms of his domestic priorities? Well, as I said before, I think um, this administration will, will try to stick to the strategy of Prime Minister Abe in dealing with the U.S. and in dealing with China and with the, the world community as a whole. And that means giving primacy to the alliance with the United States, but trying to develop a stable uh, and as friendly as possible a relationship with, with, with China. Prime Minister Abe was quite successful in uh, being close to the US, close to President Trump, and at the same time developing in the last year or two, a quite good relationship with, uh, with President Xi Jinping, who was supposed to have been in, have come to Japan this past April, but you know, COVID um, can't force them to cancel to cancel th that visit. So, it's a difficult game that Japan is trying to play to be supportive of the U.S. taking a very tough line with the Chinese, especially on security issues, while at the same time itself taking a more balanced uh, position and maintaining a good economic relationship. But also, as Mr. Suga himself has already said, you know, under Prime Minister Abe, the government now has a budget to subsidize Japanese companies 
to diversify the, the supply, supply chains by moving manufacturing, some manufacturing out of China back to Japan in the case of high value added or to South, Southeast Asia. And um, Mr. Suga said there's more, there's more demand for that kind of support than there is money in the budget. So I think we'll see him push it further the diversification uh, of uh, issue, um, but also try to maintain uh, a good relationship uh, with, with, with China. And, you know, China is Japan's major trading partner, like it is for almost every other country in, in every country in the region and beyond. So, so, so Japan is not about to uh, jump into kind of a decoupling um, uh, strategy uh, with, uh, with, with the US or anyone else. Um, it's difficult, but you know, they're, they're very well-informed people around, around Suga. He has, you know, as far as minister is very capable. Uh, his National Security Council staff is very capable. Uh, he has Prime Minister Abe uh, to, um, to, to help coach him. Uh, as, as, as Hazel Taganaka said, Mr. S Mr. Suga has been involved in every dis major decision. He's been involved, he's been on the, on listening in on, on all these phone conversations that Prime Minister um, Abe has had with, with Trump and with other world leaders. It's not that he doesn't know a lot about international affairs. My point is that his priorities are not to do a lot on the international scene. It's difficult to do anyway because of the COVID situation, he can't travel and all that. But, but his, his, object, his goal is to bring about reform, economic reform, uh, political reform, bureaucratic reform. He has to make progress on that in the next 12 months. What we haven't, we don't have time today, enough time to, to discuss, is having said all of that, how does he plan, what is his, his thinking, and maybe Hazel might have a comment on this, what is his thinking about the long-term issues that the Japanese economy faces, the, the continued rigidities in the Japanese labor market, the fact that so many people still would, people still would like to work or to work for deals that are and move them move them around to different to different companies. These are issues the government really can't solve. Um, they're in a way cultural issues. They're business organization issues. But but you know he has to have a long term economic um, uh, vision. And what can he do about it? Probably not all that much in the coming twelve months. But but. You know, he's talked a lot about SMEs. He's talked a lot about regional banks and overbanking. He has to, I think we, want, we need to see some movement on, on, on those issues. But again, to just to, re, to underscore a point we, we, we both made, he needs to get some early successes. The earliest and the, in a way the, the, the most uh, popular one with the public will be to force mobile phone companies, the three major carriers to lower their carrying charges. Japan is very expensive. Mobile phones are very expensive. The you know the the uh, subscriptions of mobile phones are, are more expensive in Japan than most in most other places. I think he'll he's already talking a lot about it. He's been talking about it for 15 years anyway. Uh, but he'll he will put more pressure on these companies. Um, there are ways the Japanese government can can influence them to to make these changes. The pushback, and you know I've been I've been following Japanese politics for a very long time. You know that no matter what Suga wants to do, the prime minister uh, is constrained by all kinds of forces. What Prime Minister Koizumi used to call the resistance forces in the LDP. There'll be a lot of pushback. So we just have to see how tough, how decisive, how strong can Prime Minister Suga be to push through his policies. And he has to get the public on his side. He has an opportunity. I think he has a real opportunity. Now it's up to him and we'll just have to have to wait and see. Well said. Takenaka-san, I'd love your response. Also, we're getting a lot of questions about some of the things that Jerry Sensei already laid out, some of these bigger term trends, specifically about uh, the demographics in Japan, questions about immigration. Do you think that, uh, you know, in terms of these early wins, what are the areas that will move the needle and that from a strategic consideration, if you were uh, giving him advice and he said, what are the top three things I can do today to get the public on my side? Uh, you know, which ones would you focus on? And then what should we be paying attention for? What should we as the outside world watching the new prime minister in Japan? What are the key variables we should be watching for? Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, first of all, 
I'd like to say Professor Curtis raised all important issues. Our labor market issue and long-term views are also needed. And but at first, at, at this moment, uh, we should focus on the domestic reform, economic reform, political reform, bureaucratic reform. And Mr. Suga is ready to do that. I think that. And also, one important feature of the Abe government was it was strongly supported by uh, Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industries bureaucrat. The influence of METI was very strong. Uh, and in this regard, uh, from here on, this uh, the uh, power balance among ministries will be changed under uh, the leadership of uh, Prof uh, Prime Minister, new Prime Minister Suga. And in that uh, process, uh, first of all, while labor market reform is uh, the most important one, in the case of Japan, uh, startup ratio, business startup ratio is low. At the same time, business closing ratio is very low. This is indicating the metal metabolism of the industry. Metabolism of the economy is very low. There are two reasons behind that. One is uh, the corporate governance is still weak. And former Prime Minister Abe changed a little this corporate governance system. And remaining one is uh, the low flexibility of labor market. Also, former Prime Minister tried to do that, but this is not enough. So I believe uh, Mr. Suga will uh, make his effort on this reform, the labor market reform. And, and uh, uh, yes, also regarding long term, I have my own uh, expectations. That is, uh, uh, in looking at the history of Japan politics, uh, Prime Minister Ohira, Masayoshi Ohira, uh, did a very interesting thing. He formed uh, nine, seven or nine special committees to describe the views of Japan, future views of Japan. This is called Ohira Inkai, Ohira committees. Well, if Mr. Suga, uh, you know, forms this kind, create this kind of committee, and by, through this committee, he can show his own views, he can create his views. And if uh, Suga government continues, uh, hopefully three, four years, then, the next prime, prime minister's role is to realize this views shown in this uh, Suga's, uh, in Kyle, Suga's committees. So at this moment, he have to focus in the very short term issue, COVID-19, anti-COVID uh, pandemic, and how to stimulate the economy. This is a very short term issue. He have to focus himself on this issue. At the same time, if he create this kind of a long term uh, the committee to discuss the long term views, well, uh, this will, uh, what I say, uh, this will activate all policy discussions um, uh, in the government. But anyway, I'm very much interested in the digitalization, the digital agency, and also the my number card reform and the labor market reform, and also uh, the uh, communication cost, uh, uh, reduction of communication cost, uh, such and such. This is the, for the important policy for the time being. Great, thank you. We're, we're getting to the last five minutes. I want to thank everyone who's been asking so many questions out there. I, I, I Overwhelming. I've tried to, to combine them as much as possible. Let me ask this last question uh, to both of you. Uh, you know, uh, Professor Curtis, one of the questions that's come up is, uh, you know, you have been fairly um, optimistic and said that you think Suga has a chance to, to kind of, uh, you know, win that term if he calls it right, if he's able to show those short-term wins. One of the questions was, is that because of the structural changes that have been made in the Conte? where the centralization of power, particularly in the National Security Council uh, reforms uh, that make uh, you know, uh, this prime minister stronger than in the past, simply because of structure, not about his personality or about him as a leader, but because of the structural reforms that Prime Minister Abe is handing to his successor. Is, is that a factor in this? And then uh, more broadly, just your final comments about um, kind of what, what, what you're expecting from here on out and what we could be watching as we think about what this new prime ministership means for Japan and the world more broadly. Sure. Well, look, the structure, you know, there's been a big structural change. It goes all, it goes back actually to the 1990s and Prime Minister Hashimoto to try to strengthen the Prime Minister's headquarters in Japanese, the Kante, uh, over the bureaucracy. Uh, and it's progressed. You know, Koizumi pushed it hard. Uh, and so did um, uh, Prime Minister Abe. Uh, so did Prime Minister Abe. And we'll see Mr. Suga do the same. But 
you know, structure and personality, they kind of interact. You can have a structural change, but if the prime minister doesn't, doesn't use it uh, effectively, um, it doesn't amount to very much. I think Suga is a very strong believer in the fact that the, in, in the idea that the Kante, the prime minister, once he makes a decision, it's the obligation of the bureaucracy to carry it out and not to sabotage it. And if they try to sabotage it, uh, he'll be not nice to the bureaucrats uh, who do that. <laughs> I think that's a very healthy development. It's criticized in Japan, but it's a very healthy development. He will push it further than any of the prime ministers since Hashimoto, I believe. Um, and, you know, we, we've, I think we've made the, Takanaka and I have both made the same point. For 12 months, Mr. Suga has to show progress and short on dealing with the short term and very important issues. How to, you know, control the COVID pandemic, how to recover the economy, how to move Japan from an analog to a more digital based uh, economy. Um, uh, and then sort of lay out a picture for long term change, but focus on these short term issues. If he doesn't succeed, well, he's not going to be prime minister after next September. If he does, he'll go, he'll probably be able to go on. And if he goes on, then he can grapple with these longer term issues, labor market mobility and, and SMAs and, and, and over banking and all the rest of it. So we'll just have to wait and see at this point. But I just want to underestimate for the, I, I want to underscore for the audience. He's not just a, a, a clone of Prime Minister Abe who will sort of do what Abe laid out and wasn't able to finish doing. He has ideas of his own. Thank you. Takenaka-san, the last word from you uh, in response to that question. Well, uh, I think uh, Mr. Suga is now has a great chance as mentioned by Professor Curtis. And also uh, right after the, uh, the inauguration of prime minister, his power is very strong. So taking this power uh, right after the inauguration, I really expect he will uh, pursue the very drastic reform, a symbolic reform he has to pick up. That's a, a strategic agenda, as I mentioned. Well, uh, reducing the cost of mobile phone uh, communication and establishing the digital agency. And in that sense, in that sense, the, 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 the performance of each minister, the performance of each minister, that's very important. Uh, in that sense, he nominated, for example, Mr. Kono as a minister, minister for administrative reform. And I am expecting a lot on his effort. Mm -hmm. And also uh, uh, the Minister for Economic Policy and Anti-Pandemic Policy, uh, Mr. Nishimura was re-nominated. Uh, he, he, his role is very important, especially in order to realize prime minister-led policymaking style. Uh, in, order, in order to realize that, as I mentioned by Kaji Sensei, well, the role of the Council on Economic and Fiscal Policy is very important. In the case of Prime Minister Koizumi, he well made use of this council. This council policy board is ch directly chaired by Prime Minister. And also, I, so, in that sense, I uh, really expect that uh, new Prime Minister Suga will show his very strong political leadership, making use of this political machines. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me turn uh, with the last word uh, to Dean Jano uh, for your last thoughts and kind of comments uh, based on what we've heard from this very uh, stimulating conversation that we could go on for hours on. And I really appreciate the time and the timeliness of this conversation. But Dean, over to you. Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Joshua, for organizing this fantastic conversation. Uh, I think we've gotten real insights and uh, couldn't be more grateful to Professor Takenaka and Professor Curtis. I think Japan society has a very special role to play uh, and, and plays it extraordinarily well in bringing important conversations such as this and in the months ahead at this very challenging time for the United States and for Japan. The ability to bring true experts who have insight together is very, very important. So uh, really my thanks to Japan Society and to both of our great speakers. Um, there's a lot of action that has to happen in both countries and I hope that we will continue to be a place that will bring ideas out that will create opportunities uh, for moving things forward. So thank you both so much. It's been a fantastic conversation. 
Thank you. Otsukare sama to everyone. Uh, good night to those of you in Japan and hope you have a great day here in the United States. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Hi, you. Thank you.